Welcome to Indoor Voices, another episode today. I'm your host, Fiona Queen, and with me today is a very special guest artist, Grammy Award winning Howard Levy. How are you, Howard, how are you doing today? Actually, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> You're in yeah. Evanston also, like me right now, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I see you've got your, your instrument and your piano there. How, how have you been managing this whole quarantine process as an artist? And, well, it's, it's, you know, human beings, we're the most adaptable species on the planet. You find people as Eskimos and people living near the equator. So, you know, we, we just adapt to anything that we need to, to survive. And uh, that's what I've been doing, uh, you know, health wise and personally, as well as musically. So um, I've been recording tracks for people. People have been working on albums during this time, uh, trying to put things out. Uh, and uh, I have an online harmonica school. I've been uh, answering many of my students uh, who send me videos to, that, I, that I respond to uh, with a video of my own. And uh, giving Skype lessons to people from different countries of the world. And wow. working, on, uh, working on my own creative projects as well. So it's kind of a, a combination of all those things, as well as the fact I'm very fortunate that my wife is a fantastic cook, so um, you know, the going out to restaurants thing is not an option still for for me. I, I just really want to be safe. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, and uh, I'd like to say I've become a better cook. I think I think I'm becoming a better cook, <laughs> but it is so different to have sort of every every meal, everything that you do, um, the workspace, the home space, the mind space. I think that's it. Um, but as creative artists, you know, I've been very interested to talk to people on this series to just say, what specifically has anything new inspired you uh, in terms of music or works uh, while you've while you've been at home? Well, well, yes. I mean, that's 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 great that you asked me that because uh, I ended up. I'm, I'm going to be putting out a solo piano CD. A lot of people don't know that piano was my really my first instrument, and. We'll get into that a little later, but uh, I, I, my wife was reading, uh, recording an audiobook uh, that was a very complicated book. It, it, it spanned thousands of years. It was not a fiction book. It was a, like an intellectual, artistic, musical, cultural history of Europe from ancient Greece to World War I. That's a and, lot. <laughs> uh, and by the background music for all this, I went, you do? I didn't, I didn't realize you were that. She said, do you want to make up some stuff? I went, sure. I mean, uh, what is this chapter about? So I sit at the piano and record, and hours and hours of improvisations that were kind of like an accompaniment for an imaginary movie that was going on in my mind of, of what the subject matter was. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very happy to do all this stuff for her. I, I did some things on synth as well. But afterwards, uh, and this went on for weeks, a very, it's a long book, uh, I started listening to some of the pieces and realized that they sort of, they stood on their own as pieces of music, but with a very contemplative kind of introspective and exploratory feeling that the combination of these elements and of my motivation made me play very differently from the way I would normally just sit at the piano and improvise because I was improvising for a specific purpose each time I sat down. And improvisation, I, I know, is uh, it just featured wonderful pianist Abraham Stockman a few weeks back, you know, who demonstrated just what an art that is. And I, I know you're also a, a master there too. And um, I even remember being in the hall at Nichols once, you know, we were presenting you on the series and the Homburg Steinway was on stage and I heard this playing and I was like, who is that? I, I, I didn't know that, uh, you know, it, it being, you know, your first and primary instrument, but, but just the way that you were playing and improvising was, uh, it's a very personal thing uh, and brings out, I think, the personality of the artist, their understanding of music as a whole, like you say, these chapters of life, history, music. Um, tell us a little bit more, and if you, if, if you wouldn't mind, you know, show us, demonstrate a little bit of that uh, um, for the viewers to see just how beautifully you do this. 
you want me to improvise something just off the top of my head? I'm if happy. You want to. <laughs> oh. Okay. Well, I don't know uh, what I'm thinking about right now in particular, but uh, I, I've been doing this since I was eight or nine years old. I, my mom, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to, I don't exactly remember this, but she said every day when I came home from school, I'd go to the piano and start improvising just whatever about what I was feeling, you know? So that was even, I was studying classical piano on Saturdays at Manhattan School of Music, but I, I really enjoyed improvising more than I did learning classical repertoire. So I'll just improvise something for you. Gorgeous. That was beautiful. Exactly what I mean. Like just your, your talent and ability of, to, to just demonstrate that with the technique involved. I'm sure people are going to be writing to me saying, where can I get the chart for that? So. <laughs> well, that was just off the top of my head, but it was sort of a feeling too. Uh, like a feeling of a kind of moody and a little bit of, of uneasy about the world. And, uh, and then kind of trying to break out of it and do something a little more positive. But there were also some odd time meters, some things in seven that, that I was playing, and, and uh, it just sort of wandered all over the place, actually. And I, I'm sometimes yeah. all of where these things go. <laughs> so. Well, speaking of the influences, because you know we're certainly all in, influenced by the current situation, but I also really want to go back to the roots. You know, obviously, as a as a pianist, where did you first? How did you first encounter uh, the harmonica? Um, uh, that's a, that's a very good question. I, you know, I grew up in New York City, and uh, it, it's uh, New York's an amazing place. It's, you know, people who grow up there like to think they're, people who are from there like to think it's the center of the world. Um, and 
But the harmonica was not a very popular instrument in New York when I was growing up. And a friend of mine, we were playing in a band in high school together. He got turned on to Chicago blues. And he had all these records. He said, hey, Howard, you gotta come over to my house and hear this stuff. And that's where I first heard Chicago blues harmonica players. And I had never heard anything like that before. Uh, I was 17 probably. And so uh, this friend of mine taught himself how to play harmonica because he loved the sound so much. He went out and got one and, and just intuitively figured out how to play. So I went out and bought one. I thought, hey, a drummer in the band can teach himself harmonica. Surely the pianist can do that. Uh, so uh, I bought one, went over to his house and said, show me how you bend those notes and play blues. And he went, well, I can't really explain it. It's all inside the mouth. I, I went, oh my, you know, come on, help me out here. He said, sorry. So <laughs> I walked around, you know, sounding like that for months. And it was really frustrating, but I really wanted to be able to do this. And uh, eventually, it's a long story, but eventually I was able to bend a note. And actually I bought a G harp, which is, I have, a, I have one here at Manny's Music for $2.25. And that was the one I was struggling and wheezing on. And bending notes on the harmonica, it's the notes the instrument gives you, just the sum of the notes of the major scale in certain parts of the instrument. Um, and it was designed as a German folk music instrument to play just simple melodies in the key written on the instrument. So this one's G, major scale, and on the bottom is the one in the five chord. So it's missing a bunch of notes. And as a byproduct of that, uh, American black American blues harmonica players discovered that you could uh, bend the pitches of these areas where there were in large intervals to create like perfect bluesiness if you were playing in the key uh, of the draw of the harmonica. It's the key of the fi a fifth above the harmonica. So, all that magic stuff that's coming out of this German folk instrument. They had no idea in Germany they were designing the world's greatest blues instrument in the 1820s and 30s. And so uh, that's the sound that drew me to it. And once I figured out how to bend notes and play those blues licks that I had been hearing, very exciting. It was like the first day of the rest of my life. And then the blow notes on top also bent. Whoops, I played an extra note there. <laughs> And then I got frustrated with the fact that all the notes were not on the instrument. Being a piano player, I was used to instruments that every, every instrument has all the notes on it. How could this instrument not have all the notes on it? I loved it so much that I was determined to find the missing notes. And there are six of them, they're missing from three octaves. And I discovered that if I bent in the opposite direction, try to bend the blow notes on the bottom, the missing notes would pop out. That one. So in the middle octave, all of a sudden you can play chromatically. And on the top octave, you do it in reverse. You draw where notes aren't. And the bottom octave, uh, that one. But all of those are, those other notes I played, it's all bending in tune. And I'm doing that by visualizing the piano keyboard in my head. <laughs> and that's what I'm seeing in my mind when I'm playing this. And so, if I'm understanding it correctly, one wouldn't have happened without the other, like without absolutely, the piano. Absolutely not. Uh, I was the guy, the 18 year old stubborn kid who came along and made this a thing because nobody else before me was stubborn enough and a uh, combination of elements that loved this instrument so much had the piano thing. I was already a, a good jazz pianist and uh, you know, I had chops and was writing interesting tunes and I, I wanted to take this instrument into that world. 
I can't imagine what that must have felt like uh, to, to figure out, you know, as I said, pioneer, uh, you know, world-class scientist to, to get to this part, but then just to take the can opener off all of it and then to have that freedom um, must have just been such a joy for you. And for everyone else, of course, playing with you and listening and all of this music that we've been so privileged uh, that you shared with us. Um, would you mind sharing a little bit more? We'd just love to hear you play. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, yeah, it was, it, it was exciting. It was, it was thrilling feeling to, I felt like the, the, I know this name is not popular, but like an explorer, like a Columbus, discovering a new world in here. You know, of course, the world that Columbus discovered wasn't new, but I, I, that's what I felt like, a, an explorer. You know, that I was exploring this instrument and discovering more and more stuff inside it. And so I'll play you a piece on harmonica and piano uh, simultaneously. Um, the, the beautiful Duke Ellington tune uh, in a sentimental mood. Outstanding. Just, uh, I, ca I can't tell you. I'm just smiling from ear to ear. It's going to hurt later. So, <laughs> no, it's such a pleasure, especially at this time, you know, where we are all needing uh, to have something. I mean, the recordings and things that, that we can listen to, it's been wonderful that organizations have made things possible online, but there really is no substitute for, you know, the immediate gift. That, that an artist does spontaneously like that. So I thank you very much. Um, you've, you've had, have, you absolutely have such a, such a brilliant career and you've had uh, experiences and collaborations with, you know, some of the greatest artists, Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones, Trio Globo, and of course, a very long time uh, collaboration between you and Chris Siebold, you know, can you walk us, uh, a little bit through uh, that lifetime so far. Well, how much time? <laughs> <I know. laughs> I'm asking a lot. I know. No, I really. Uh, what started happening was uh, in my twenties uh, when I when I just moved back to Chicago from New York. I went to Northwestern for a few years. I moved back to Chicago, and then I started playing in the in the late seventies with a wide variety of people, folk people 
like Steve Goodman and John Prine and Bonnie Kolak. And then I started my own uh, jazz quintet called No Bad Vibes and joined Chevrolet at Chicago, yes. a really fantastic Latin jazz band that yes. afro and music. Started a group called the Balkan Rhythm Band that played Bulgarian and Macedonian music and was playing jazz at noon at Andes with all these older jazz musicians um, and got into the jingle scene playing harmonica on thousands of commercials. And so I had this incredibly broad scope of, of music on many instruments, uh, I used to play sax and flute. And I still play some mandolin. Um, and so it, Chicago provided a very, very fertile ground for me to learn a lot about a lot of different kinds of music and play live five, six nights a week. Yeah. Um, and then uh, my reputation started spreading. I started playing piano and harmonica with Paquita de Rivera in the mid 1980s. Uh, and uh, continued playing locally here and recording all sorts of stuff. Uh, a lot of folk albums, um, world music stuff. And then I met Bela Fleck. And uh, we started the Fleck Tones together with uh, Victor Wooden and his brother Roy, future man, in the 88, 89. Um, and I did that for four years. And that was a, an amazing kind of a groundbreaking group that where all four of us were doing unique things on our instruments that nobody had done before. So we were kindred spirits. Yeah. And uh, that kind of propelled me into a, a more visible position musically. And I started collaborating with people uh, in Europe a lot uh, with yeah. the Lebanese lute player, Rabi Abu Khalil, and recording with him, with the uh, very uh, brilliant uh, avant-garde bass clarinet player, Michael Riesler, uh, ended up recording uh, wonderful album with him, which I'd like to play a tune from, uh, <laughs> on the Angel label, um, and just tons of touring in Europe, uh, did an album with pianist Anthony Molinaro, we had a duo together, we toured a lot, Anthony's unbelievable pianist. I know Anthony quite well, you know, we've, um, he was a, we were both uh, students of Ursula Oppen's, my path. Oh, that's right. I was with him at uh, Northwestern University, and then he came and did his uh, solo Rhapsody in Blue at Nichols Concert Hall, so. I yes. remember the piano almost moving away across. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a strong pianist, I tell you. Yeah. <laughs> so all different stuff, you know, and then I started my own record label and uh, started recording stuff under my own name, much more than I had done before. And it's called Balkan Samba Records. And I have uh, 12 or 13 CDs and a DVD on it. Every style that I play, uh, stuff with Chris Siebold and Acoustic Express and Chevere and uh, jazz albums and uh, my, my harmonica concerto that I composed. I have a classical CD on that label and then the cover might look familiar to you. So I'm sure. I, <laughs> <laughs> it was, I called the Fiona on the phone and asked her if it was okay to take a photo of the nickel. So she said yes. <laughs> You can have the keys. I'll give you anything you want there. You're always uh, uh, welcome. And, it, and it's been such a pleasure to have you a number of times in, in that beautiful space. You know, I remember um, presenting you for a, a Bach Week benefit, and I remember you brought several harmonicas, including one that was, you know, almost the size of, to me, like a dining room table. It was like, <laughs> I, I don't have room, but the bass harmonica, I think yeah. I used that effect on like one note or something. Yeah, that's right. But it was but it was really yeah. beautiful. Did I play the uh I played part of the uh B minor orchestral suite finished yes. with the That's oh, right. Yeah. Richard Rubster also performing uh I think yes. working on that. That's right. Yes, yes. That's yes. a fun memory. Yeah. The you know that that whole classical thing uh I love playing classical music on the harmonica uh because you know, one of the things about it, and I know that you, I think you're going to play a little excerpt, but I, I just have to play it for you now to show you why I did this. The uh, the slow movement of the Bach flute sonata in B minor, this first, the first one. Uh, the slow movement goes down. Now, if you play that on the harmonica, it's a blues lick. I mean, it always sounded like a blues how did lick. He know? How did he know? <laughs> I mean, from the south side of Leipzig. <laughs> so 
I played it in a gospel-y, bluesy way, but I played a lot of the original notes too because I've been performing uh, Bach flute sonatas on the diatonic harmonica for years in respect and then playing the note for note. But then I started improvising more on them and, you know, all those classical composers were improvisers. Yeah. They, uh, they had to be. That's what you do. You make up music, you're improvising. And so much classical music is theme and variation. And uh, it's just that they wrote it all down because their notational skills were incredibly high. If they wanted to survive, they had to write everything down. I mean, Mozart, Schubert, and Beethoven, Bach, all these guys could sit, you could whistle a tune to Bach and he would improvise for an hour on it and improvise fugues. Yeah. Basically. And so uh, I think it's very much in the classical music tradition of the, the great composers who laid everything out for us to improvise. Right. Uh, and all, all of a sudden, you know, the, the cadenzas for concertos. Oh, for, absolutely. And that, I, I'm so happy to see some artists, you know, uh, really trying to bring that back and demonstrate just it shouldn't be a lost art. That, sh that should be something that's that's a real badge of pride. If <laughs> yeah. Yes, make up your own cadenza. That's what it's there for. Even in a lot of the sonatas of Beethoven and Mozart, there's a caesura there, and it's that you're supposed to play a little cadenza. He didn't even bother to say it, but yeah, Mozart meant it to be a little, a little something there, and Beethoven meant there to be a little something there, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just that, of course, that tradition was lost in classical music due to the incredible demands of. Classical musicians are supposed to be able to play everything from Bach to Schoenberg and beyond. And where's the, where do you have time to improvise? You, you're just right. like yeah. hanging on for dear life to all yep. this different kinds of music and try to play it all at the highest level. But I jazz, did actually uh, do a, uh, wrote a cadenza to a Mozart piano concerto 467 that I did with um, Chicago Chamber Orchestra. And I remember, you know, the, you know, and you end, you know, 5 1, that's where everyone comes in. but concert master in rehearsal stood up and he's like, Could, can we get the, the music or something? And I'm like, I didn't write it down. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it was fun and interesting and challenging. And um, I highly recommend uh, that the people give that a shot. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's more faithful to the spirit of the music. Yeah. And that those notes are, they're exact on a certain level, but they're not really exact. I mean, there's lots of room for expression uh, and and uh, sometimes repeats are put in with the understanding that back then people didn't play the same stuff on the repeat. They right. you know, exactly. vary it a little bit, and that's yeah. become a convention. Of, uh, I know with the Mozart clarinet concerto on the repeats, you're not supposed to play the same exact thing. Uh, you know, because the yeah, the interesting thing about classical music is that there was it was handed down. There were certain teachers who were taught by people who yes. studied with the composer. Yeah. Yeah. You know? that's right. And that's the way it is in jazz. People play with the masters and then they, they get something from that and they pass it on to the people they play. There's a lineage to it, absolutely. Um, yeah. and, and you can sometimes tell when you listen to someone playing, you're like, I know where this line is gonna go if I follow the tree. So yeah. Talk a little bit about uh, what composers specifically classical, and uh, I know there's there's a there's a Bach uh, movement that I think we're going to play uh, that you have sent in by recording. But um, talk a little bit about that and why Bach. Well, I, when I was um, fourteen, uh, I studied the pipe organ for two years, and I got the the foot chops, and and I played the Passacaglia and Fugue in C minor and the Toccata and Fugue in D minor. And, a whole bunch of the other ones. And as a kid, I didn't really like Bach that much. It was sort of seemed like a like an exercise to play it on the piano, but playing it on the organ was a whole different feeling. It was really wild, and some of the music was very kind of gypsy-like. Uh, and so I, I developed this deep love for Bach from that experience. Uh, and many jazz musicians love Bach because uh, Baroque music uh, was very much like jazz in many ways. And of course, I discovered later about figured bass parts and that they didn't bother to write out the whole keyboard part and as a, when it was a keyboard accompaniment, that the keyboard players back then were supposed to understand how to read these chord symbols and play the bass line with their left hand. And this, this is just like jazz. Yeah. Uh, right. And Bach had an amazing range uh, 
of expression. Uh, he was very spiritual and he was very devoted to, to God in a very, very serious way. And very similar to my jazz uh, idol, John Coltrane. It, it was all, all the music was, after a while in Coltrane's life, all the music was for God, you know. Wow, I, don't, I didn't what, know that. Same thing, I mean, he was inspired. Uh, and also he was just a one of a kind, uh, ridiculous genius. So uh, his music is eternal to me and uh, very fruitful ground to improvise on. But I, I, I of course, love many other classical composers and uh, I really like Ravel a lot. And he, he listened to a lot of jazz as well. Mm -hmm. He was very uh, attuned to jazz and blues. Uh, and jazz musicians uh, love Ravel yeah. and, and Bartok. Mm -hmm. So I'm very fond of those three composers. And uh, I've done performances of the Bartok Romanian dances uh, with a string quintet. I, there's a string orchestra arrangement. And I wrote an additional first violin part. And I play the first, first violin part. But I also improvise on it. Wow. Love to hear that. <laughs> uh, Bartok listened to jazz, too. I mean, um, you know, they, they, they recognized the Europeans, uh, they recognized the great genius of American jazz because they weren't racists. Right. In America, it was the, 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 the white society, it, it just took a long time for, for uh, America to recognize the genius of jazz. Even though it was pop music, uh, they, the rest of the world held it in incredibly high regard as art, as great right. art. Yeah. Very much so. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, Bartok, if you were alive today, would, would have loved to have formed a, a chamber group with you. <laughs> I have no doubt that that collaboration well, would have been seamless. Well, yeah. And Bartok was also into the, you know, of course, into the folk music of his country yeah. uh, that inspired so much of his music and not and using unusual modalities. And, um, you know, those guys were uh, kindred spirits, you know and inspirations. So this, this Bach movement that um, you are both playing uh, harmonica and piano, is, is that correct? And well, not at the same time, <laughs> although I do that. <laughs> <laughs> sort of the right change. But uh, I, I practiced it for a long time and uh, had my more bluesy gospel -y take on the, the chord progression. Just played it over and over again. One morning I just was overcome by a feeling for it and I just went into my little studio over there and played the piano part on keyboard with a very good sample piano sound. One take, I, I was just like, dialed in, and then I overdubbed the harmonica. Uh, and as I was playing the piano part, I'm singing the, the melody and kind of what I wanted to improvise in my head, probably out loud, um, in order to accompany myself. Right. And that, that's a sort of a tricky process uh, of self-accompaniment for something you haven't played yet. You know, uh, and that's something that we're learning a lot about in this pandemic time. You know, people are asking me to do tracks that will have like a vocal on it later. And, uh, so I'm imagining, I just did one for a singer uh, the other day that had uh, just piano. And it's, good, and it's gonna be drums, bass, guitar, and the singer. And uh, it felt really weird to do, and it would be so easy if we were all playing together. Yeah. I had to record it to a click track because it was so slow that it was hard for me to play by myself without rushing. Yeah. A very slow tempo. This is a challenge. I just got it back from her and uh, the drummer recorded brushes on it and she recorded a vocal. It sounds really good. I am I, not surprised. <laughs> like a stride stuff. a band 
people sort of coming and going and playing fills and it's going to work. Oh, really? But it's, no surprise. Again, anything you put your, your finger to like Midas, it works. It's gold. So oh, let's take a, let's take a listen to this uh, uh, beautiful Bach. That was really beautiful. Again, uh, your sound um, and just the intelligence of how you're able to, and I won't use the word like manipulate because that's not it, but you're creatively expressing um, your, own, your own personality and your own style through um, one of the most acclaimed composers of all time. And that's, again, I just say this, that these collaborations are beautiful and I know that people are really just going to be enjoying this. Um, in a list of things that you also sent to me, you mentioned, you know, that, that there was something on 9-4 uh, and that it was sort of something old and something new and... Um... Well, I came, I came up with this bass line in my head at, uh, sitting on a bus while I was in high school, a bus in Brooklyn, and I had just started listening to Latin music. Uh, and so I thought, oh, I wrote a nice little Latin bass line. And then I realized it was in nine. It's like, whoa, well, that's interesting. And I started, uh, what, what could I put over it? And I started putting all these melodies over it that were kind of uh, mathematical relationships. Uh, the bass line is. That's the nine. 
And then I went. Kind of like a nursery rhyme. And you could do it in quadruplets over it, you know. And then I had another one. I thought two nines is the same as three sixes. Why don't I, I have a lick in six. And then later, there's three of those fit into the two bars of nine. When I started studying Indian music and learned about Indian rhythmic devices, this one called a tihai, I realized if I started this lick on beat two, the last beat of the third iteration of that little fig funk figure in six would come out on the downbeat of the next bar. So, two. Like that. And so that's a lot hipper, you know? But I was, I was kind of onto this when I was a kid, and I just started being able to, I just had fun with this thing, uh, trying to play just all sorts of crazy stuff over it in the right hand, and just having fun, and then later composing little Indian rhythmic figures and stuff. So could I play that for you? Absolutely. All right, now I'll get rid of the mic.
see you you know you've got left sorry what's that I screwed up a few little things oh was... yeah uh no <laughs> we're not none of us are accepting that at all that was incredible and oh thanks you have a you know left and right side of the brain and i think you have many more pockets that that <laughs> just don't have to be able to pull that off and so i don't know if you caught that the fact that i was playing donna lee in four four <laughs> Where, where do you have to kind of park that? Uh, you know, in contemporary music, I've done a lot of, and I know that, you know, there are polyrhythms and things, but, but to be able to just kind of freestyle about that, I think is, you really have to be able to, to let that left hand not intervene with what's happening. So is that challenging or how do you manage it? I don't it's know. easy. It's just, yeah, that's I, what I'm saying. It's just who you are. Stuff like this over the years, um, in different time meters, I've always been drawn to uh, what people call odd times. Um, that just means you can't divide it by two. And so to me, um, they're just as comfortable as 4-4. Four, four. Uh, one of my favorite time meters is 11-8, the Bulgarian uh, rhythm. Uh -huh. Basically, it's two, two, three, two, two. One, two, one, two, one, three, one, two, one. That comes from playing in the in the Balkan rhythm band. That my yeah. love for Bulgarian music and uh, getting comfortable in these odd time meters. So I can. That was just I was just making stuff up in eleven. I can sit down for hours and do that from years of doing it and playing for dancers too. Oh, I can, I can imagine, yeah. And watching their bodies move in these time meters. So it's not an intellectual exercise. It's it's a groove. Answer right. Yes. And uh, and that, that thing at the end when I was playing would, would be like an Afro Cuban on Tuno, but it's in an eleven, you know. You know. So that's my love for both of those traditions coming through. So I've practiced tons of things like this where I, I'm playing a pattern in my right hand that's an ostinato improvising in my left, or a pattern in my left hand that's a... Uh, this is a... Uh, you know, that's an 11-8 uh, tune that I, that I play. Uh, so, just tons and tons of time and, uh, and, com and composing things, you know, like you learn by writing things that you can't quite play and then you learn how to play them and then you, then you ascend musically that way for if that's the way I learn anyway. Yeah. Well, speaking and of time, you know. Being thrown into situations where people think, like especially in harmonica, oh, he can play anything. And they put something in front of me and I go, oh, all right. <laughs> uh, let me go into another room and practice for a half hour. Maybe I'll figure it out. But that's good thing. Yes. You know, is people think you're better than you are, and then you have to, you can't let them down. You know? I don't think anyone's wrong there. I think your adaptability, like you're saying, you, you could go into the other room and just figure it out. And that you, it doesn't translate to everyone. And you're just going to have to accept the compliment because we all know it a bit better. <laughs> well, some falling on my face, you know, uh, it, it's sometimes it takes years to get over that, you know, when you fail at something. In music, and that, that's something uh, that I'd like to actually mention to people that everybody messes up sometime. Um, it's, it's a, a very part. important part of that learning process, though. Dangerous yeah. if it hasn't happened, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah. listen up, Music Institute students. There's there's been kind of a little lesson in each one of these things that we've done. So. Um, I think I think that is important. Plus, it's also disarming for people to be able to hear artists as uh, excel the way that you do, and yet know there's that human side that something's 
you know, there's been an effect somewhere along the line and a learning process and it does happen to everybody and not to let it be the end of something, but the beginning of something better, you know. And also the ability to uh, take criticism. Yeah. This is really hard for somebody who's really good to uh, be working in a situation and somebody tells you, no, what you're doing there isn't right. You know, I said, it isn't? Like, no one ever told me that before. Well, you know, it isn't sometimes. And you have to be willing to put your pride aside and realize that um, other people, especially if you're working for someone else and they want to hear something different from you, you, you have to accommodate them. And my, my years of experience in recording studios and working for all different kinds of people and producers, uh, I had to jump through a lot of hoops for people. But I, I really regard that as good. It, it, it teaches you um, to, to not put yourself in the front all the time. The, the music should be in front. And uh, if you do that, if you put the music in front, then you're going to you know, come to the front naturally rather than trying to impose yourself yeah. too much on the music. I see that a lot out of uh, you know people that do a lot of chamber music. You can always tell that when they step into the limelight as a soloist, they're constantly aware of that position and you know still collaborating. Um, and I'll I'll bring up you know Matthew Lipman from from last week's episode because I saw it in uh, in his beautiful uh, performance, just the way that he would engage with his colleagues, and I think that comes through in the music, again, that you're saying, you're not just the one in the front, but, but, but you've been part of this discussion all along. So, a gorgeous example. Yeah. Yes, that's the thing about, you know, that we play music. You know, kids, when you're little, you have to learn how to play well with others, and that's <laughs> you. We, that's the biggest compliment you get, is if musicians want to play with you. Yeah. You must be doing something right. Yeah. It's not just like, oh, he's paying us an, a lot, so we'll play with him. No, it's like, I want to play with this guy because yeah. he's fun to play with and, and he interacts and listens. I mean, that's, that's the thing. And a lot of the greatest musicians that I've met are the people who are the most fun to play with and the most interactive. Well, that's your, your legacy also, I'm sure, to all others. I've, I've seen it from you at the hall. I've seen it when we've done collaborative things, even like the January series and just having a blast. And that's the best experience of all. And I have had a blast talking with you today. It's, it's really, speaking of time, is uh, just such a wonderful thing and a joy to see you. Um, and, I, and I want to be able to, to take out this episode performing, you know, another recording, uh, the Bach Siciliano that, that you did with Chris Siebel. The, is that from the E-flat flute sonata? Yes. All right. Well, the uh, art plus adrenaline. Well, really, Howard, I can't wait to see you live on stage again, and we're all going to get there. And until then, uh, yeah. it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. You're welcome.